Uh, today's psalm is psalm number two. Okay. Why do nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earths rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord and fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessings to all who take refuge in him. And so um, they say that this Psalm 2 is a part of what many Bible scholars say is a prophecy of the Messiah. And can you hear that in there, all over that you know, passage? Um, but that the Messiah would be opposed in, in vain by the rulers. <laughs> Sorry, you can't hear it. He didn't hear it. He can't hear it. I, I, I heard, but, you know, that's but, little, but it's but. all... The, the last uh, 11 and 12 um, verses are the reason why I don't like yeah. the Old Testament. Yeah, you don't like trembling. and I don't. I, I don't. The God of love. And, and if I'm going to focus on trying to study, I like the New Testament because yeah. that, that, that just says it all in one sentence. Yeah. In Psalm, Psalm number two is, they say it's credited to David. And do you know why it's credited to David? It doesn't say. David, but a lot of the Psalms are credited to David, but uh, in Acts 4.25, um, it says, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. So they actually, in Acts, they are attributing it to David. Um, and then also in Acts, uh, it says the apostles applied this idea to the persecution of Jesus by Israel's religious leader. In Acts, they say, if indeed Herod, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So it's... You know, even in the New Testament, God's deciding that this is happening. Yeah. So, um, any other thoughts? I like it when, you know, it shows God laughing, you know, mm -hmm. at these kings and what they're doing. Ha, ha, ha. You know, who do you think you are? Kind of a thing. And it's also known as a royal psalm. It says it's um, Psalm 2 in some way is quoted at least seven or eight times in the New Testament. Um, so the New Testament writers really like to go back and refer to this psalm in relation to Christ. Um, primarily in Acts, but also in Hebrews and in Revelation is where it's quoted. Um, and it's part of this royal psalm includes references to the eventual rule of of earth by the Messiah. So any other thoughts? Okay. Um, in the Kathy did a really great summary uh, last week of this new section that we're in now, uh, sec uh, chapters 56 through 66. Uh, which brings us to the end of Isaiah, okay, 
and we will be finishing in the next three or four weeks. <laughs> and next, <laughs> next Ezekiel, no, <laughs> Jeremiah, no. <laughs> New Testament, <laughs> next time. <laughs> yeah, well, think about, think about that, what you would like to study, you know, next, next year. Uh, and we've, we've studied all of the books of the New Testament, mm -hmm. but we can always start, start over, over because there are a lot back. of people, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, how about, just, how about astrology? Astrology. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And New don't neurology. forget, don't forget that sometimes we uh, will spend a year studying a Bible that's a book that's not in the Bible, but that's about the Bible. So, you know, it doesn't have to be just the book of the Bible. If you've got something else you'd be interested in, let us know about that too. Yeah, I think a lot of, a number of people have expressed to me that they really like to study the Bible. Yeah. You know, so it's, but that doesn't mean that you're not studying the Bible if you're studying a book about, about the Bible. But um, anyway, in, in 56, in the um, uh, Bible project, they have the, the, it takes two actual short videos to go over the book of Isaiah and where they do an overview of, of Isaiah. And in chapters 56 through 66, they kind of explain this as in 60 and 62, chapter 60 and 62, there are three poems, beautiful poems, it says. Um, and they are uh, 60, 61, and 62. It says at the very center are three beautiful poems that describe how the spirit-empowered servant is announcing the good news of God's kingdom to the poor. Um, and it talks about New Jerusalem. And then on either side of those, of, of those three chapters or three poems, there are prayers of repentance in 59 and then 63 and 64. Uh, and then uh, last week we studied um, in between and, and before those prayers of repentance, there's other collections of poems before and after. So it's all kind of sandwiched, um, a collection of poems, then a prayer of repentance, the three poems in the center that we'll be studying, then another prayer of repentance, then more collection of poems, and then there's kind of it's all wrapped in a framework in uh, in the begin beginning and the end. So uh, Kathy went over uh, last week. She finished with the first collection of more poems, chapters 56, 57, 58. Okay, and that we are now in chapter 59, which is one of the first prayer of repentance, is what they call, and that's. At least that's how the Bible project summarizes those. And there's a um, in the in the overview video, it has a, a particular illustration of how that is all kind of wrapped, you know, or the chose chapters are kind of wrapped around. Uh, uh, I don't I think I described it so. So we're going to get started with chapter 59. And it says, surrounding those poems are two long prayers of repentance. The service confess Israel's sin and grieve over all the evil that they see in the world around them. And so they ask God to forgive them and his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to read that. Uh, Sarah, or do you want to read? Yes, ma'am. I'm ready. Okay. Um, I can you read the whole chapter, one yep. twenty one. I can oh, do that. Okay. Let's go. Um, and just for your information, I'm reading from the contemporary English version today. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> we should have The Lord has since not lost. Hmm? Since we're contemporary. English, we should understand. That's it. right. <laughs> I would hope so. The Lord hasn't lost his powerful strength. He can still hear and answer prayers. Your sins are the roadblock between you and your God. 
That's why he doesn't answer your prayers or let you see his face. Your talk is filled with lies and plans for violence. Every finger on your hands is covered with blood. You falsely accuse others and tell lies in court. Sin and trouble are the names of your children. You eat the deadly eggs of poisonous snakes and more snakes crawl out from the eggs left to hatch. You weave spider webs, but you can't make clothes with those webs or hide behind them. You're sinful and brutal. You hurry off to do wrong or murder innocent victims. All you think about is sin. You leave ruin and destruction wherever you go. You don't know how to live in peace or to be fair with others. The roads you make are crooked. Your followers cannot find peace. No one has come to defend us or bring about justice. We hoped for a day of sunshine, but all we found was a dark, gloomy night. We feel our, we feel our way along as if we were blind. We stumble at noon as if it were night. We can see no better than someone dead. We growl like bears and mourn like doves. We hope for justice and victory, but they escape us. How often have we sinned and turned against you, the Lord God? Our sins condemn us. We have done wrong. We have rebelled and refused to follow you. Our hearts are deceitful, and so we lied. We plan to abuse others and turn our backs on you. Injustice is everywhere. Justice seems far away. Truth is chased out of court. Honesty is shoved aside. Everyone tells lies. Those who turn from crime end up ruined. When the Lord noticed that justice had disappeared, he became very displeased. It disgusted him even more to learn that no one would do a thing about it. So with his own powerful arm, he won victories for truth. Justice was the Lord's armor. Saving power was his helmet. Anger and revenge were his clothes. Now the Lord will get furious and do to his enemies, both near and far, what they did to his people. He will attack like a flood in a mighty windstorm. Nations in the West and the East will then honor and praise his wonderful name. The Lord has promised to rescue the city of Zion and Jacob's descendants who turn from sin. The Lord says, my people, I promise to give you my spirit and my message. These will be my gifts to you and your families forever. I, the Lord, have spoken. In, in other interpretations, what do you have for verse 20? <clears throat> Mine is New American Standard. A Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. Yeah, mine also, NIV, has the, the Redeemer will come. So it says, the Lord says to his people, I will come to Jerusalem to defend you and to save all of you that turn from your sins. And it repent. And remember John the Baptist? Repent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, prepare the road. <laughs> so in um, Golden Gate kind of talks about this particular chapter in three different sections. Uh, he offers that um, it... Um, the prophet condemns the people's sins, the people confess their sins, and the Lord prepares to rescue people. And he calls, uh, um, he said that, the, that there are three different areas. There's the challenge, there's the prayer, and there's the promise, you know, in, in this particular chapter. And it starts off with, um, we've heard about the arm of the Lord before in Isaiah, and it says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save it. So I can save you, Bernie. You know, there's no problem, you know, but you're the one keeping me from saving you. It's what, it's what he's saying here, that it's the sin that has hidden my face from you, that what, you are, what you're doing, the actions that you're taking is, is hiding me from you. Um, and I think in 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 other chapters as we come up, it, it goes into this even further um, about you know what the what the what we've heard about in the the fifty some chapters before about what the people in what the what the Judahites Judah Judahites or Jewish people <laughs> have been doing. Um, and yet in the second section, you know, where 
prayer where they're where they're where the people are then are talking it's like so justice is far from us we look for the light but it's all darkness and so they're looking for someone to save them and they're saying you're not saving us you know and god's saying well i'm not saving it because of what you've been doing you know so um and but then in the end in the, in the third section with um it where it says the lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice meaning that there wasn't anyone coming forth to save them or that they weren't able to save themselves do you think that are humans able you know what do we what have we what do we learned about our own nature are we actually able to be uh righteous i don't know if it serves our purpose <laughs> and, this, and so therefore no <laughs> no it serve, serves our purpose yeah and i think in the come in this chapter and in the coming chapters the, the, I think that's one of the main points that I see being brought across is there's no way that we can do this on our own. You know, that God has to step in and God steps in, you know, for us as Christians through Jesus Christ, you know, to to save us, to, to, to give us a way of being close to God and to give us a way uh, toward righteousness. It says uh, the Redeemer will come to Zion. Uh, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips. So um, it's that the, that the prophet, that in a vision, this particular prophet in Isaiah has seen that these kinds of things will happen. And it's up to the people of Judah to kind of turn from rebellion in order to find themselves on the right side when he does come, when the Redeemer does come. Any other thoughts as you were reading this chapter? I want to take an aside here because we're talking about different versions of the Bible. I know Harold is a red letter and in Thomas Jefferson created the red letter bible as i know but i was curious where did jefferson draw his sources and i assume it was the king james james bible jefferson compiled the work of four languages greek latin french and english and corresponding columns he purchased two copies of each three translations of the new testament he needed two copies to cut passages from the front and back of each page and then the life then what version of the Bible did he create? The life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth, commonly referred to as the Jefferson Bible, is one of two religious works constructed by Thomas Jefferson, compiled the manuscripts but never published them. The first, the philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, was completed in 1804, but no copies exist today. I was just curious because we're always going between Bibles and the red letters mm -hmm. kind of struck me as mm -hmm. looking for them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the commentators that I read too was saying that um, this this particular chapter kind of brings up the idea of how we really need to approach and look at the Old Testament study. It says some of the statements that he said was God used the Israel nation as a microcosm of every person. Of, of each of us. Every time we see God highlighting their failure, we should be seeing him highlighting our failure. Uh, we are no better. We are no different. It says, listen to Paul's words to us from Romans. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches, for God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on us all. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, where Jesus is basically in kind of speaking quite a bit to the Pharisees or the leaders, the religious leaders of the day, saying, uh, 
so you don't murder or commit adultery or lie, but but that's not the point. You know, that's not the real point. It's did you think about you know that that it says uh, that was never the true standard. Think that way lowers the bar to think of oh I didn't murder anyone, so I'm righteous. You know, I didn't steal from anyone. Darn. Therefore, I'm righteous. <laughs> <laughs> A lot more simple than I thought. <laughs> Didn't Jimmy Carter say, I never was an adulterer, but I must have been my own man? Yeah. Right. Right. And so we are, we are, what would you say, hopeless, <laughs> but hopeful. You know, that Christ you know, um, brings the good news, you know, for us. Um, any other thoughts about? It's interesting how this idea of if you do enough good, that God's going to take you into heaven, that it's about what we do to do enough good. Well, because... Um, <laughs> My sister periodically has these dreams and she'll tell us about it and she'll go. So anyway, I dreamed I died and I was at heaven's door and God says to me, well, what did you do that should let us, let us let you in? And she always answers, well, Angie and Berkeley are my brother and sister. They did more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of going to come in on their coattails <laughs> and it you know, we talk about how it's not about what we did. You know, the answer to that question is, you know, I believed in Jesus mm -hmm. and that he was the son of God and came to redeem us. That's the answer. Yeah. I didn't do anything that's going to merit me this grace that you give me. But she's always looking for an answer to that because she's very well aware <laughs> that she doesn't do things for people yeah. you know like her goal has always like i asked her once because she gave her child to me to raise and i oh asked her once how much money is enough money for you and she goes not till i have all the money in the world and when i said has it made you happy and her response always is I've been unhappy in some beautiful places. Interesting. Yeah. And so wow. it's just an interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting philosophy, very foreign. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. were brought up in the same household. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, well, part of our problem, that. part of our problem is that um, you know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And so we have we understand there's no such thing as a free lunch. God's gift to us is a free lunch and then a banquet on top of it. And that's why we have hmm. trouble accepting. Yeah. But we have to go up for the banquet. Yes. And there's that story in the New Testament where, you know, the the king or the wealthy man invites all these guests to an elaborate wedding feast, and many of them don't come. And then he opens opens up the feast to the poor and the lowly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And and the Jewish people were coming, and so he opens it up to the Gentiles. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> it says we are we were helplessly separated because of our sin. Not only could we not remedy our sin, we couldn't change our nature. If God had forgiven us and left us, had forgiven us and left us to our own, we would still be the same people. Okay. Um, therefore, when he saw that there was no man to intercede, his own arm brought salvation. He put on his armor and went like a warrior. He crushed the enemy. He redeemed. Okay. So it was through God and Christ. Um, uh, and it says in Revelation, when John wept because no one was found who could open the scroll, the angel said, weep no more. 
Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. And I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Uh, God was appalled, went out like a mighty warrior, and became the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And I know that that's a big question about sin versus what was Christ's role in in coming and bringing the good news. Okay, we the next chapter uh, goes into one of the first poems, and that's chapter 60. Let me find. Okay, page six or sixty. Here it is. Okay, and I think sixty is also um, <clears throat> about twenty-two verses. Would someone like to read sixty? I can do that. Are, are you cool with that? Go ahead. Really? Yeah. Let's. Okay. Let's hear the. I, I want the good news Bible. I want to hear the good news from Bernie. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this chapter is titled "The Future Glory of Jerusalem." Arise, Jerusalem, and shine like the sun. The glory of the Lord is shining on you. Other nations will be covered by darkness, but on you the light of the Lord will shine. The brightness of his presence will be with you. Nations will be drawn to your light, and kings to the dawning of your new day. Look around you and see what is happening. Your people are gathering to come home. Your sons will come from far away. Your daughters will be carried like children. You will see this and be filled with joy. You will tremble with excitement. The wealth of the nations will be brought to you. And, across, and from across the sea, their riches will come. Great caravans of camels <clears throat> will come from Midian and Ephath. They will come from Sheba, bringing gold and incense. People will tell the good news of what the Lord has done. All the sheep of Kedar and Nebaioth will be brought to you as sacrifices and offered on the altar to please the Lord. The Lord will make this temple more glorious than ever. What are these ships that skim along the cl like clouds, like doves returning home? They are distant. They are ships coming from distant lands, bringing God's people home. They bring them. So they bring with them silver and gold to honor the name of the Lord, the holy God of Israel, who has all who has made all nations honor his people. The Lord says to Jerusalem, foreigners will rebuild your walls and their kings will serve you. In my anger, I punish you, punished you. But now I will show you my favor and mercy. Day and night, your gates will be open so that the kings of the nations may bring you their wealth. But nations that do not serve you will be completely destroyed. The wood of the pine, the juniper, and the cypress, the finest wood from the forest of Lebanon, will be brought to rebuild you, Jerusalem, to make my temple beautiful, to make my city glorious. The, defendant, the descendants of those oppressed who oppressed you will come and bow low to show you their respect. All who once despised you will worship at your feet. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion, the city of Israel's holy God. You will no longer be forsaken and hated, a city deserted, no longer a city deserted or desolate. I will make you great and beautiful, a place of joy forever and ever. Nations and kings who care for you as mothers and nurses, as a mother nurses her child, as a mother nurses her child, you will know that I, the Lord, have saved you, that the mighty God of Israel sets you free. I will bring you gold instead of bronze, silver and bronze instead of iron and wood, iron instead of stone. Your rulers will no longer oppress you. I will make them rule with justice and peace. The sounds of violence will be heard no more. Destruction will not shatter your country again. I will protect and defend you like a wall. You will praise me because I have saved you. 
No longer will the sun be your light, be your light by day, or the moon be your light by night. I, the Lord, will be your eternal light. The light of my glory will shine on you. Your days of grief will come to an end. I, the Lord, will be your, inter your eternal light, more lasting than the sun and the moon. Your people will have all will all do what is right and will possess the land forever. I planted them, I made them to reveal my greatness to all. Even your smallest and humblest family will become as great as a powerful nation. When the time, when the right time comes, I will make this happen quickly. I am the Lord. I am the Lord for this time. I will do this swiftly. How swift is swiftly. <laughs> Ooh, thank you. Thank you. That was that like was my dad would say, in a while. In a while. <laughs> yeah, soon. <laughs> Real soon. <laughs> So um, Golden Gate kind of calls this chapter um, an invitation to imagination and hope, okay? We've had Jerusalem community lived, lived with an everyday experience that fell really short of what God's had, had promised them. So in chapters 56 through 59, uh, we focused on what the community needed to do if it expected God to act. In 60 through 62, these poems, it's on what God promises to do. Okay. And Jerusalem is still experiencing devastation. Uh, some of the people are still in Babylon. You know, they still haven't returned, you know, to Jerusalem. So 60 starts with picturing the sun dawning over the city. That people can finally awake with sun on their face faces, and that uh, vast resources are going to be coming along with along with the people to worship God in Jerusalem. Um, Golden Gate gives a little bit of a story about Christopher Columbus, and he says Christopher Columbus quoted Isaiah sixty in connection with his voyage to the Americas and explained to the king and queen of Spain that his aim was to bring the resources and countries across the seas for Jerusalem's restoration. His journey was a fulfillment of what Isaiah had promised. Okay, so that was Christopher Columbus's, you know, thoughts about that and how he used... Wasn't he heading to India or somewhere? <laughs> yeah, he got, he got lost. He got really, yeah, yeah. Like, right, yeah. Yeah. right. Right. His, his way of uh, so getting those resources was not exactly right. Though. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, when you're going to go to the king and queen and you want money, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. The return <laughs> trips were intentional. The first one was just a little off. <laughs> I wonder at what point he just looks at the land and says, rot row. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, says the chapter's imagery makes it clear that it's not giving a literal picture of political and economic events to transpire in Jerusalem in the decades that will follow or in the days to come in years later, okay? That um, it says there's a Jewish story connected to chapter 60. A man walks out, uh, a man was out walking at dusk and several people lit a light for him to illumine his way. But each time, the light went out. Eventually, the man concluded that from now on, he would just wait for the dawn. So wait for this to happen. You know, um, the parable stands for Israel, which saw Moses' light go out and Solomon's, but now waits on, waits only for the light of God. Okay, um, the Messiah, whatever to come and save them and however their description of what that saving means you know which was a lot different mm -hmm. than what we what they we and they thought but it's showing all of these all of these resources coming to them you know and that might lift their hopes slightly but soon or when when will this happen generations is when it's happened. Any other thoughts about 
60. That's the first poem that's in the center of the, this section. The second poem is 61. And that is, um, hey, let's see, I think that might be a short one. It is short. Say. Yeah, 11 verses. Oh, he's the brave soul that wants to do 61. I can do that. Okay. The spirit of the Lord God has taken control of me. The Lord has chosen and sent me to tell the oppressed the good news, to heal the brokenhearted, and to announce freedom for prisoners and captives. This is the year when the Lord God will show kindness to us and punish our enemies. The Lord has sent me to comfort those who mourn, especially in Jerusalem. He sent me to give them flowers in place of their sorrow, olive oil in place of tears, and joyous praise and praise in place of broken hearts. They will be called trees of justice, planted by the Lord to honor his name. Then they will rebuild cities that have been in ruins for many generations. They will hire foreigners to take care of their sheep and their vineyards, and they themselves will be priests and servants of the Lord our God. The treasures of the nations will belong to them, and they will be famous. They were terribly insulted and horribly mistreated. Now they will be greatly blessed and joyful forever. I, the Lord, love justice, but I hate robbery and injustice. My people, I solemnly promise to reward you with an eternal agreement. Your descendants will be known in every nation. All who see them will realize that they have been blessed by me, the Lord. I celebrate and shout because of my Lord God, the saving power and justice are the very clothes I wear. They are more beautiful than the jewelry worn by a bride or a groom. The Lord will bring about justice and praise in every nation on earth, like flowers blooming in a garden. And I'll just say the first couple of verses there um, are what David preaches on today, because that's those are the verses that are that Jesus reads in the temple. Mm -hmm. when he goes back to Nazareth. So I would say um, verses one through through two mm -hmm. are in the in Luke. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um I love this chapter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um the um in the um Bible project it gives uh there is a um a video that overviews just this chapter. Mm. Okay, and it says, Israel at this time had been conquered and ruled by other kingdoms. They'd been reduced to grief and mourning, but there were some, among those mourning, the, uh, there was still a small group that never lost hope in God's promises. And so this poem is written to encourage that group, you know, of people. Um, the the prophet is showing a vision of a restored world. And in the first section, which you're referring to, um, um, one through three, it it's what we are very, very familiar with from from Christ, with uh, beginning with um, its creation through the new Messiah. It begins with the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because God has anointed me. And when you hear the word anointed in Hebrew, it's mashish, mashish, which is the word for Messiah, anointed. Um, and, that meant, and then they go through seven acts of this new creation, okay? Um, it is the Messiah goes through God, says that through God's spirit, he's going to bring seven acts of new creation to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners. And another interpretation would be blind, the blind, uh, to comfort all who mourn, to bestow on them the crown of beauty instead of ashes and you know, so there are two acts just kind of describing giving them new clothing. Okay. They're going to have a new tiara, a new headdress. They're going to have new clothes and they're going to have oil for anointing, anointing them, just like the oil is used to anoint the Messiah. Uh, so he's kind of duplicating himself for, 
for these lowly, these people that he's coming to preach the good news to. Um, One of the things he sent was the blind, and I just wondered if that was literally blind people or just people who can't see. Well, it's always parables. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Could be both. Yeah. <clears throat> And then right in the middle of these um, acts of creation, he talks about um, um, the year of the Lord's favor. And that's one statement, I think it was in Luke that we have. It says, right at the center of the seven acts, the Messiah says that he will proclaim the year of God's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Okay, and he says, what's this vengeance all about? You know, well, it's about the Old Testament, right? Um, it says, this is a reference to the ancient Isra uh, Israelite practice of the year of Jubilee. Mm -hmm. I had, have you, are you familiar with the year of Jubilee? Mm -hmm. I am because David talked about it in the <laughs> sermon today. <laughs> Wasn't before this. The jubilee it meant it, it was meant to happen every seven every seven times seven years where everything gets reset. Okay, slaves and prisoners get their freedom. The debts are cancels. Yeah, uh, families receive their ancestral land. It's a radical practice. It's a sign that points forward to the renewed creation, like a cosmic jubilee. Okay, so. Why is it a day of vengeance? Well, if things are going to be reset, you can imagine that it's not going to be good for everybody. Okay. It says, it says for those who benefited from oppress oppression and from unjust social arrangements and whatever, it might not be quite as jubilant, you know, for some people. It all depends on, you know your your situation and when what you were doing and you know, how you were making your ends meet. There's a lot of ones actually good. I was just thinking. You know, yeah. I mean, if he's trying to get the sleepless <laughs> ones pack, he needs to tap into that fear of jubilee. And then in the in the kind of the middle section of this, it's it says it's rebuilding the rebuilders of the creation. It takes. This takes us to the middle section of the poem, and it says it's it's which is all about the role that that these anointed ones will have in the world to bring restoration, um, and they will build the ruins of old. They will reestablish former deserted places, and they will renew the devastated cities. That type of thing. Um, so it kind of goes into that, you know, area, um, and. So strangers will stand and will feed your flocks and sons of foreigners, they will be farmers and vineyard dressers. So instead of being slaves to other nations, God's going to turn the table now and make those nations serve them. But it says not quite like slaves. Okay. It's, it's not like that. It's uh, not, they're now oppressing the people that were oppressing them. It says you will be you meaning the Israelites, will be called priests of God. And the imagery is not about mastering the slaves. It's about uh, serving the nations on behalf of God as from a priestly standpoint. Uh, so they're acting like a bridge between God and the people. Um, he will eat the wealth of nations and boast their riches. This is, what's this about? And it's about the remember in Israel, the priests were got their food from sacrifices um, that people brought, you know, to God. And so they lived off the abundance of the community. And so these as new kind of jubilant priests, priests they're going to benefit from the abundance of all the nations. But it's abundance and not, you know, scarcity. From that. Um, and then it goes into the third section where I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices for God. Uh, it says we get to the part where the Messiah himself is celebrating what's God, what's God's going to do to the world. I will rejoice greatly in God. My being will shout for the joy of God. Um, and it, um, 
And in the final lines, it is describing this ultimate, it's an ultimate wedding party. And remember all the stories that Jesus talks about the wedding, the bride, the bridegroom, the wedding. Um, it says, and it's uh, the final lines of the point describe Israel as a new garden of Eden for the land brings it out its sprouts and as a garden makes its sprouts seed plants. So the Lord Yahweh makes the sprout righteous and the praise for all the nation before all the nations. So uh, it does go into uh, Luke um, 4, 14 at the very beginning where Jesus returns from Galilee in the power of the spirit and he has been across the whole countryside and everyone has praised him for his teachings but when he then he comes to Nazareth you know and he's comes and he reads the scroll of Isaiah it's handed to him and he reads those first two lines the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovering sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the jubil the jubil the jubilee, jubilation, right? And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back. He stopped right there and said, you know, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then wasn't this Joseph's son? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and so um, hopefully uh, the next chapter, 62, is kind of a continuation of the Messiah's proclamation that in 61. And so it's going to continue the description of this jubilee. Um, and it wants to consider the text of Luke. It says, as we begin, I want you to consider how Jesus spoke of this text. Jesus came to Nazareth, attended the synagogue, was given the scroll, and uh, he says, the jubilee has come. It's here now. And so, hallelujah. Yes. I just wanted to make one comment, too, and I don't know if this is any relation, but in verse 3, um, they will be called trees of justice planted by the Lord to honor his name. It reminded me of... Um, the avenue of the righteous, a place where trees are planted to commemorate rescuers during the Holocaust, people who rescued mm -hmm. the Jews. Um, well, that was, what, what, what verse was that? Uh, that was verse three, where it talks about it says, the trees of justice. Yeah, and I think that it says, and they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of God for a display of beauty. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I heard it, the oaks of justice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would with that, with that tree. is why they planted mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. And then they also planted the forest of the martyrs, which was a memorial to the six million Jews who died. Mm -hmm. 